That was the horrific thing. That was the nightmare. I'm speaking with Zubaira Shamsuddin of the Uyghur Human Rights Project about the Gulja incident of 1997 and its lasting imprint on the Uyghur people. The CCP states they were defending against extremism and terrorist activity. The Uyghurs state that unarmed protesters in the streets of Gulja were met with extreme violence and repression. After China, as you know, after the 80s, that Deng Xiaoping has opened up policy. Um, you know, we, the Uyghurs had little bit just a breathing time. And um, at that time, the Uyghurs economy flourished. Especially that Gulja, because it's border to Kazakhstan. Um, from Gulja to Kazakhstan, it's only 200 kilometers away. You know, it's very close. So for Gulja people, it was kind of really great opportunity. You know, they did trade between Kazakhstan, you know, Central Asia and China. And because of the Uyghurs' um, trade skills and their other ability, they really flourished. That flourishing didn't make Chinese government happy. After that, what Chinese government did was um, purposefully, because in Uyghur culture and Uyghur tradition, there is no such a thing that um, the Uyghurs would involve in drug abuse, alcoholic, alcoholism, or you know, smoking, all sort of things, because of uh, religion prohibits that. The one way the Chinese government tried to slow down or destroy that kind of flourishing is they tried to dismantle the Uyghur young people's society. And slowly, because of that open up policy, and that um, trade connection and other connections between Central Asia and the China, and the China, uh, the, the authorities allowed some drug dealers to sell drugs in this city and try to make Uyghur people, young people, to get addicted to it. You know, the drug was so cheap at the time, because later we have learned that it's so cheap and it's it was so accessible. and. Just any young people and start to, you know, start to get addicted to the drugs. And top of that, the alcohol, smoking, the, you know, the, the anything that can affect on the vegan society was such a, such a cheap price and accessible from everywhere. The government didn't stop drug dealers to do that. I mean, purposefully, they encourage drug dealers to distribute drugs everywhere, every places, including restaurants, even mosques. That society start to dismantle slowly, slowly. The, some young people took the role of the changing the society or changing the young people. The young people decided to form a meshrap, a cultural revitalization that focused on education, religious practice, and weaker cultural activities. Abdul Hillel was one of the young people who had been a successful businessman and lost his wealth due to drug addiction. He was one of the leaders of the young movement. He stood up and educate, started to educate others, other young people that look, we've been um, tricked and we've been deceived, we've been targeted to be destroyed. So let's wake up. The, the Meshrep movement became so popular because the, everybody supported especially the families, the society, who were unable to get that kind of support, treatment of drug abusers or smokers or any, any Uyghurs that, who didn't want to work just other than destroying everything. But those young people were able to stop it. And they start to organize not only just the mesh, but cultural activity, sports activity as well. And instead of uh, they just staying home, doing nothing, and making trouble. Uh, they start to involve the sport activity and start to exercise, like running in the morning. And when they run in the morning, and police start to stop them. Like my brother-in-law was telling me, once they ran on the streets of Gulja in the morning, and if, you know, a few policemen came in, why are you running? And they were asking from them, why are you running? And they said, be exercising, but you're not allowed to exercise. You shouldn't be running. If you want to run, you should ask from the authority. And that's how um, paranoid they became. 
But whatever those young people were doing, everything was legal and it fit into the law of the Chinese government. And they did everything with permission. None of the things were done, you know, however they wanted, because they did not want any trouble. Group of young people, again from the Mashrep and other groups, they said, let's just try to organize a football, you know, soccer event, because the Uyghurs, one of the favorite sport is soccer, you know, football. And then they got permission for that as well, you know, from the sports department of Gulja, and they got permission. And they, they, the competition was going to start just next day. It was very cold weather in Gulja, in, especially on February. It's very cold, February, March is very cold still. And although they got permission and they tried to do that big event, so playing event, everybody was very excited and this, the event was going to happen just next day. You know what they did? They um, pour water on the stadium and they make frozen ice. Next day when young people went and tried to, uh, you know, have that event, the soccer tournament, the stadium was frozen ice and they were unable to play. The Chinese government actually stopped to arrest people. And they actually started, they started to arrest the leaders of whatever activity, whatever movement. The first they arrested Abdul Khilil because he was leading the Meshrab. After Abdul Khilil's arrest, the young people, they took to the streets, the protests and demanding government to release them. And that protest turned into bloody massacre. Those young people, they had nothing on their hand. They were very simple, you know, just to release our innocent person, you know, friend, and just to respect our rights, respect our religious rights, cultural rights. That was the only demand that they had, but they had nothing on their hands. And for, towards those protesters, the Chinese armed force opened fire. They, the Gulji streets, tainted with the blood of the young people. So among them, like my sister, she was arrested too, just simply because she helped one of the lady, the, whose husband was the part of the Meshrap. And then my cousin, he was 24 years old, he got arrested and he got shot. And he was shot in front of people, he was shot. Just simply because they accused that he was a part of the Mashrap movement. And then my another brother, he got arrested in 1998, after my nephew was shot. And my brother, he's still in jail and he was sentenced for life in 1998. Nine, you know, he got arrested in 98. We haven't seen him. I traveled in 1998 to Gulja just to, to see. You know, at the time I wasn't think of anything, you know. I mean, I didn't feel kind of fear of anything because it was horrific. And what the Chinese government is doing is absolute massacre and the genocide because they were all innocent, very young people. That was the horrific thing. I mean, that was the nightmare. In August of 2020, President Trump issued an executive order to curtail the operations and downloads of specific Chinese-owned mobile apps in the United States. The stated intention was that of American data privacy and national security, as Chinese-based company data can potentially be collected by the Chinese government. A deal was offered that entailed the platforms be sold to U.S.-based companies and fully detached from all China-based infrastructure. Opponents argue the order was a tactic to curtail the success of Chinese-owned platforms and broker a deal to shift ownership to U.S.-based companies. In July 2021, the Biden administration revoked the prior executive orders and ordered a security review by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce. When it comes to assessing the role of the tech companies, Zubaira is clear. They definitely 
contributing, helping a lot in undertaking China's genocide. Because, because of those tech companies, the Uyghurs every breath, every move are monitored. Not only just within the concentration camps, even outside the camps is not different from the camps, inside the camps. Yes, inside the camps, they're locked up people, you know, like uh, ships, or animals, and they're doing whatever they want to do to them. But outside the camps is not different too. Like, you know, you know that the Chinese government mobilized thousands of Chinese officials to live with bigger families to monitor. That's physical, you know, in-person monitor. Top of that, the tech monitor. And every Uyghur has a phone, which is that telephone is, that cell phone is allocated by the authority. It's not something that willingly those people buy. You know, there are apps in the telephone that they can monitor every move, whatever they're doing every day. So it is just, you know, the Ovilian state. I mean, it's, it is just a tech-controlled, complete cage state, you know, the prison, open prison. So there are other American companies and you know, tech companies and the many, the companies that they could make money from other places too rather than from genocide.